Good to see everyone. Good to see you all. Good to see you, Jim. Good to see you to be in our thoughts and our prayers. And good to see Jane and Kara, his name, mom and sister. And uh, good to have the Reese family back and visitors here with the Cooks this morning. Good to have you with us this morning. Uh, we've had a wonderful week of fellowship. We had a wonderful hymns and s'mores event uh, on our grounds. I always tell people on our where is the event being held? And I said, on our lovely grounds here at First Christian Church. Uh, and we do have grounds. It's not just our yard. We have grounds. Um, and so we had a wonderful time. So thanks to Phil and uh, Jim Coffey for uh, manning the grill. And uh, the songs were put together by Dan and Bill and his brother. The brothers Johns, as we're calling them. So it's a return engagement from them. But lots of good food. And, uh, thanks to Angela and Tammy for being our s'mores masters and so lovingly preparing all of our s'mores. And then we had a choir fellowship hosted by Karen and Dan last night. Again, beautiful weather, good food, and conversation and fellowship. So thanks to Karen and Dan for hosting. So we've just had a good time this week of being together, and that's always important. And hopefully we'll continue to, uh, beyond just our regular coffee hours, it's just nice to kind of be out and enjoy the weather and have a good time. We are still in need of folks to help pack the backpacks on Friday. We have three people signed up, so if you have time on Friday to help us with that, uh, be sure to stop, put your head in the Sunday school room and see the overflow uh, that you have contributed to. So I'm sure that Sue and Martha will let us know if there's anything more to be done. Elders will be meeting on Tuesday and we'll be staging all the supplies. So the countdown has begun. I hope you are praying every day for good weather, no rain, sun, low humidity. We must be specific. <laughs> we want no rain from the evening of the 14th until we break down on the 15th. It's also my wedding anniversary, so my husband is guaranteed to be here. Where else would he be? <laughs> except here with me, except here out of town. So, uh, Kara Walter has confirmed that he will be helping me to cut hands. Right? <laughs> okay. um, I have always been, I'm always amazed by the Holy Spirit, but uh, once again, I think the lectionary has offered us up a lovely gift uh, in terms of the text this morning and in terms of some of the things that we as a church are even thinking about. Um, and a lovely, lovely scripture. Um, I grew up in a church where I was, my grandfather was a Baptist uh, minister, as I've told many of you, not Southern Baptist, but Baptist. Um, and we had something called Baptist Training Union. And it, it met at 6 o'clock every Sunday for an hour. And when we were small, we had Bible drills. And so you memorized the books of the Bible, and then, you know, how many of you had Sunday school memory verses, right? Where you memorized a verse in Sunday school? So I grew up in an environment where you kind of learned the scripture. You learned what it meant, but you definitely needed to have some things. Um, Psalm 119 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I'm of an age, as many of you are, when I grew up, all there was was the King James. There was no message, there was no living Bible, there was no revised standard version. And so what is in my heart is the King James Version. <laughs> so whenever I read certain texts, and this morning I was thinking about it as we did our call to worship, Psalm 51, when it talks about truth in our inward being, um, the King James says, truth, Lord, in the inward parts. Um, there are all kinds of little phrases like that that stay with us. And one of the most important phrases we've heard people say it all the time is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And we say this because we as a tradition are very ecumenical. We believe that we're Christians only, but not the only Christians. It's part of the litany of things that Disciples of Christ, Big D, uh, our denomination that we say about ourselves. And we believe, as you all know, in essentials unity and not essentials liberty and all things love. What it means is that we're not uh, taking full claim on every point of theological doctrine that's out there. You can be a member of our congregation, worship with us, be among us, and disagree with us on a number of things. The only thing is that we land on one confession, and that's that Jesus is the Son of God, and we proclaim him to be Lord and Savior of the world. 
Apart from that, we can have give and take on a lot of different things. The importance of that is that what it means for us as Christians and what it means for us as people who seek to be Christ's presence in the community and seek to show that love in the rest of the world is that we have to learn how to deal with difference in a way that does not mean that different is deficient. Paul is dealing here with the Ephesians who are Gentiles, which means they're not Jewish. Paul was criticized by the first disciples and the early Christians by extending what they believed to be the Jewish salvation. Jesus was their Messiah. He was the gift and the fulfillment of Jewish scripture. Paul was making this huge claim that Jesus actually had a message for the whole world and not just the Jewish people. And if you can imagine, if you are used to a non-Jewish or a non-monotheistic religion where perhaps you were worshiping lots of different gods, and as we know, a lot of the polytheistic, meaning many gods, those traditions, you remember studying Greek and Roman mythology in, in school, the gods were not often very nice people. The gods had human personalities and jealousies, and they got mad, and they threw things, and they cast curses on people, and they banished you into outer darkness, and uh, they ate their children, and they did all other sorts of weird and bizarre things. The Jewish God is a God of vengeance and justice and anger, too. And along comes Jesus with this message of unconditional love, not a message of judgment at all. And so not only the Jews don't really get what he's talking about, but the Gentiles certainly don't get what he's talking about. And Paul is trying to say to them, it doesn't really matter where you've come from or how we've all gotten to this point together, but there is one God in all, through all, for all. And because of Jesus Christ, we can all be one, and therefore we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So Paul's first task is to let people know that this is for you too. That's often a hard task when we're trying to convince people that church or Christianity or God is something that they should pay attention to. There was a very sad um, post on Facebook last week by one of um, the guys that I went to high school with and actually went to school with him as early as fifth grade. <coughs> In sixth grade, uh, at assembly during a storytelling hour, I told a very interesting story about being in the fifth grade and going to a new school was an academically talented program, the ATC. I say that because we, that's the way we always talked about it as fifth graders. We're in the academically talented program. It meant that a group of us had been tested and been deemed that we were smart enough to be in this special program. And we were driven, our parents had to bring us to the new school. I went from being in a school that was about 50-50 black-white to being one of two black kids in the whole school. We were doing a history play, and we had a, a little session. It was a Montessori type of thing where kids got to say what they thought about things, right? Free time, a lot of instruction time. And all of a sudden, one of my friends, you just heard her blurt out. She said, David, that's a horrible thing to say. And of course, when you blurt something out like that in class, the teacher wants to know well, what was said. <laughs> and so there was silence in the room, and David sat there, psh, didn't say anything, was scared to death, I'm sure. Karen said, he said that Terry and Susan should be in our play as slaves, and that they should pick cotton. And my response, I won't say the full response, because it includes <laughs> since I'm in the pulpit, I'll... <laughs> But I stood up, put my hand on my hip, and said, David, if you want to pick some cotton, you're going to have to pick it your D-A-M-N self. <laughs> well, the next year, I did tell this story to Simply. The story ends well in the play. My dad comes. My dad's upset because these things have been said to me. My mom's upset because I use a curse word. Of course, of course, your mom is upset about that. Could you have said something different? So my dad uses the moment, I recite this beautiful poem by Langston Hughes called The Negro Mother. So I am a slave in the play, but this, the poem talks about the struggles of black people and the legacy of, 
of struggle and resistance and resilience, etc. The next year on the playground, in the sixth grade, the academically talented program has been moved to a different school where I'm still like one of two kids, two black kids in the class. There's a huge stump on the playground, and the rule is, in our class anyway, is if the girls make it to the stump first, they get to play there at recess. If the boys make it first, they do. Well, on this particular day, the girls were already on the stump. And my friend CR comes up. CR, by the way, is the child of immigrants from Syria. Remember, we're sixth grade. CR says, you guys need to move. And I said, we were here first. This, these are the rules. And this is America. We go, we play by the rules. This is what Terry says. That's what's here. This is America. We play by the rules. CR says, well, if it wasn't for us white people, you N-words would still be slaves. And I said, what did you say? You come and say that to my face. He walks up to me, says the N-word in my face, smacks me, shatters my glasses, which are octagonal wire rim glasses, because it's 1972. And there are no shatterproof lenses. And the shards are on my face. I didn't know this at the time. All the kids in my class are like, huh? what's going on? I turn around, march into the office, and say, please call my mother. They want to know why. I say, CR called me the N-word. <gasps> no one really knows what to do. I call my mom, my mom groans on the phone. All she knows is, oh God, she's done it again. <laughs> She's in trouble. Over the years, and I took the time to tell this story because this is a person with whom I had a great deal of conflict as a child. Later, he's visited a mutual friend who happens to be the other black girl who was in the class and said to her, do you think that I could ever be able to apologize to Terry? I feel so bad about what happened all those years ago. Do you think she'd get together with me and allow me to apologize. And she said, I think she would. Next time you're in town, we should, we should all get together. He was in town last week. They didn't call me or contact me to get together. But he did post something about being a former Christian and not being sure that there was anything in Christianity for him. <clears throat> And I thought about this sermon, and I thought about what Paul's trying to say to the Ephesians. And so someone who has deeply wounded me as a child, I am now figuring out how do I reach out to this young man who was so mean to me. CR and I happened to be one of eight valedictorians in our high school class. Well, I was the same kids in the academic and code program. And we never really had a lot of, to say to each other. We were civil. But I'm very moved by two things. Number one, that life has progressed to the point where he wants to apologize after 40 some years. <coughs> and also that he's at a point in his life where he doesn't think that Christianity is for him. And to say that we need you is far too simple for the problem that we have to face. There are people out there who think that Christianity is not really what they need or want, even as they realize that they themselves are in need of some kind of transformation. We hear it all the time. People are leaving mainline denominations. Right? People don't come to church as frequently on Sunday as they used to. They're here Sundays, they were not here every week. No offense to any of you who travel and have vacations. That's all going. <laughs> and that happens a lot here. For <laughs> but there are people who are searching for significance and at the same time don't believe anymore that God in church can bring them that significance. And here we are on the other side going, we need you. We really want to do some good things here and we need you. We don't need you in sort of a desperate kind of I hope that if you're a visitor to our church that you see our 
love and affection, our excitement to see you, not as like, oh my god, there's a visible glow. <laughs> We're so glad to see you. But we hope that you see it as our desire to share something with you that we think is just and that's the all-encompassing love of God. We've gone through a process to become an open and affirming and prayer reconciliation anti-racism church. You've heard me share stories of moments in my life where I didn't necessarily always feel so welcome. And how I know how important that is. Paul is trying to tell these Gentiles, we need you, not just because we want to build up this new religion that we got going with, but because we think, and Paul himself personally believes so much that the message of Jesus Christ is that he loves all, that he includes all, that he cares for all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he goes on to say that by grace, God has given each of us <coughs> one at least, maybe more different gifts. He talks in 1 Corinthians how it's not so important that you use that gift to boast or impress people, but really that the gifts are used for the benefit of other people. We have lots of different talents and gifts and excitement among us. If you've ever been the new kid in class like I was, you have to figure out sort of what's the dynamic here. We were all new kids in the academic and talented program. Not a single kid had gone to school with another one of those kids. We had to figure out who's who. We had different, every week we had a different job. One week you'd be president of the class, the next week you'd be uh, the nosy news hawk. There was a column in our local paper called the nosy news hawk. And so if you were the nosy news hawk, you gave us a digest of the news from the morning paper. My favorite job were two, the poet and the weatherman. I'm really into weather and you got to take the map in the paper and you had to get to school early and draw the map, the highs and lows, and talk about the clouds, and that would be your job. Every morning at class meeting, you did the weather. If you were the poet, you had to have a poem to read. All these different ways, and some of us figured out that there were things we liked better than others. I loved being the weather. I liked being the poet. I could care less about being the sportscaster. <laughs> I also didn't like being the parliamentarian. There were some people who really loved being the <laughs> but in order for this big lesson called learning to do different things and figure out what you're good at to work, everybody had to do their particular part and they had to figure out what they liked. That's why it's so important for kids to be able to try things, try a musical instrument, try a sport. It's important for you to try things in church. Maybe you might want to try out the worship committee. Maybe you want to be in Sunday school. Maybe you want to help with adult ed. Maybe you want to chair a committee for the fair. Maybe you want to be the treasurer. Maybe you want to be the chair of the congregation. You can at least try it and see whether or not that's something that fits. So when we say we need you, it's not, oh, please, 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 please. We don't know what we'll do without you. It's not that kind of desperation. It's the sense that each of you has something to do that no one else can do quite the way you do it. And so there, while there might be several people who could preach, maybe there's something about the way I preach, or maybe there's something way about John Shandell preaches. So when you're calling a pastor, you're looking to say, there's a lot of people that we could get to preach. But maybe there's something about this person and how they do it, and how they connect with us that says this person is going to be a good pastor. Maybe there's something about the way Rick plays the piano and his ability to play just about anything you put in front of him. We could get a lot of people to play the piano, but we might not get Rick's savvy swing <laughs> or his ability to just take anything and make it beautiful. We could get anybody to keep books. Not many people would care as much about the details to this. We can get a lot of people to be chair of the congregation, and we're blessed to have a chair who has administrative gifts. I hate to tell you this, but if you're going to be the chair of the congregation, you really need to be able to organize things. That's part of what the job would require. 
we can get a lot of people to do a lot of things, but whether or not they'd be the best fit for that, for us and for that person, is what we mean by we need you. We need you and your individuality and your uniqueness. We need you to bring things that no one else can bring. And so as new people come to join us, we need them. We need them because they're fresh wind. We need them because they're new ideas. We need them because maybe they have a perspective as a person of color, as a gay person, as a transgender person. If we say we're really open and affirming to all, we need all to be present at the table so that we can benefit from those perspectives. That's what corporations will tell you about diversity. The best diversity is the diversity of opinion, thoughts, and ideas. That's what we say at the University of Chicago. We don't do such a great job at that, but that's what we say diversity is. Thoughts and opinions and ideas. We need to work more on being, <laughs> on the kinds of people that we bring together. But that's what we need. If we want to show people that Jesus is relevant, we have to show them lots of different kinds of people for whom Jesus is relevant. Because they'll be like the Ephesians, looking at all the Jews going, I'm not one of you. I'm not a part of that. I can't see myself in that. We need you and we need so many other people here to make sure that what happened to my friends here doesn't happen to any of you or to other people. And that's to say, I'm not sure what Christianity has for me. My heart breaks, and I'm thinking and praying about how I reach out to CR to let him know that if he wants to talk to me, I don't even need his apology anymore. I'm more concerned that he's given up on God. And that's something that to me is just the saddest thing imaginable. And CR's not the kind of guy that's going to want to be approached as though I know everything and he knows nothing. He did his degrees from MIT. He's not a smart guy. But there are people in the world who may walk through this door and maybe they're at that point where they're saying, I'm not so sure this is going to work, but I'm going to try it. And maybe if you're the kind of person sitting next to them, you not only give them a hug, but you say, we're really glad you're here. And maybe you listen to them and figure out what it is they like to do or are interested in doing. And maybe you share with them that we need them. Not because we're desperate. Not because we want to grow, although we do want to grow. But because we want to be a place where everyone, the same God, in all, through all, with all, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, because we're better than everyone can be here. Every quarter we have a convocation at the Divinity School, and I'm given a chance to say my greetings to the families and the graduates, and I always end my remarks with this. We are better because you were here. And it's amazing what that statement, it's now one time I forgot to say it and the dean said it. It's become an important thing to tell our graduates that you didn't just pass through. You were here and you made a contribution. You may not have been at the top of your class. You may not have been the person who answered every question or wrote all the best papers. But you touched us in some way. And the Church of Jesus Christ needs to remember that we are all better because we're all here. We were joking last week that we missed the drummers. You don't really think about it until something's like not there. We're a gym. Lily or certain people aren't in place doing certain things, then you know, oh. And we just assume certain people are going to do certain things. But we always have to make room for the fact that there can be more people who can do not only those things, but other things. We will be better when new people with different experiences and different backgrounds come upon us. And we are better right now because each one of you is sitting in this seat. There is no way we can do the fair. There's no way we can do Christian education. There's no way we can do music. There's no way we can do a PowerPoint. There's no way we can record our sermons. There's no way we can do outreach.
I preach to those among us who are sick and bereaved. There's nothing we can do the things that we do unless you do what you do. And you do it in a way that no one else can do it. That's why we need it. Because we're better because of you. Paul really wanted the Ephesians to know that this was all about. That it was all about them too. <coughs> And that's my heart's desire for you this morning, that you know this is really all about God, but it's always still about you, because you are God's heart, you are God's desire, and unless God moves in us, we have nothing to tell the rest of the world. Will you think about what you do and how you do it? Will you think about making room for other people to do what they do, how they do it? Will you be inviting? welcoming as we say we are to all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds and experiences. We don't want any more CRs giving up on God because they feel that there's no place. People are seeking significance. They are seeking some form of transcendence and they are seeking a place to be loved. We need them. They need us. We all need each other. We need each other to survive, and we need each other to thrive. May God continue to give you that sense of where you are, where you belong, that you do have a role to play, that there is some significance in your life, that he is a transcendent force in your life, and that because of that, you can share that same testimony and make room for other people to experience that same sense of significance and transcendence. We need each one of you, First Christian. And I'm thankful that you're here because we are better.